guys, let's summarize where we are, what we're doing today, where we're going next class. Um, so that can be our friend. Okay. Everyone here knows what income is. Project 1061. You know generally what's excluded from income. And um, in addition to knowing what's excluded, for example, 102, 119, 132, 101, 102, a whole bunch of code sections dealing with what's, what's excluded from income. Um, then we turn our attention to computing gains and losses. Everyone here, compute gains and losses, right? Right. And then, so from 1001, you know what the basis is in assets. You know how to compute basis. And um, you know what is the amount realized. You know for gains, they must be realized and recognized. You know for losses, they must be realized, recognized, and allowed. Okay? Let's say from 1, 6, 5. Right? Right. All right. Then we moved on. And we began our journey to figure out what is the character of income, right? What is the character of income? And we looked at issues pertaining to what is a capital asset? How are capital gains, capital losses treated? What are the limitations on capital losses? What are the preferential rates? We then turned our attention to when it was 1239, 1245, 1250. We saw that there are certain recapture provisions. Anytime you have transactions with related parties, you have to have your intent up, right? Right. So we then moved on once we figured out gains and losses. We figured out the character income. We then had to turn our attention to who is taxed, right? Who is taxed? And we saw, unlike the prior renditions where um, we had to figure out amounts, character, and the like, here it was simply for the performance, it was for the performance of services, uh, Lucas Fierro, Fruit of the Trade. And then we had cases pertaining to property and the famous Hellring v. Horse case, right? With interest coupons. And those, chapter 12 dealt with all uh, court decisions, right? There was many, many court decisions that uh, we had to examine. It was not really code oriented. What we've been looking at more recently are the issue or is the issue of what's deductible, right? We turn our attention to chapter 14, right? And examine or start down the path of determining what is deductible. Now, with respect to what's deductible under chapter 14, we turned our attention and looked at code sections. There's several that you guys should start having familiarity and comfort with. <coughs> We had code section 162, code section 263, right? Capitalization rules. And 262, right? That does not permit a deduction, right? I just want to make sure my phone's off. Um, does not permit a deduction for personal expenses, right? So we covered those. And we saw, for example, Code section 162, peanut butter and jelly with 162. Always keep in mind code section 274, right? In any instances, puts limitations, right? On the deductibility of expenses under 162. So these are some introductory code sections. What the authors do, which is not unusual for this kind of tax force, is unpackage, right? Code section 162. What do I mean by unpackage? Look at the examining, you know, code section 162, and it has the prefacing language. All ordinary <coughs> and necessary expenses. What does ordinary and necessary mean? What does the word for phraseology carry on? Any trade or business? And then the authors go through 162, A1, A2, and A3.
So he said, in your famous your list of famous cases, you certainly want to include Lucas Piero, well-known case, perhaps even this weekend you used it. Way to attract attention. Um, we then saw that it's not always easy to distinguish repairs from improvements, right? We had several different cases that uh, dealt with that. We looked at the DOPCO case dealing with intangible assets and then the subsequent regulations that were promulgated. Looked at the Frank decision dealing with issues of carrying on. I believe we also went through, correct me if I'm wrong, went through exactly the spring, right? And the independent investment test. And how to discern what is reasonable compensation. Remember, you can only get an induction for reasonable compensation. With the Charles Club and the contingent compensation arrangement. And I believe, unless you tell me the contrary, we left off with travel away from home, right? So, here's what our, our objective is, guys, tonight. Um, we will, if we can, cover various kinds of expenses, what's deductible, what's not. If things fall in place, I will try to get up to depreciation. And um, with the anticipation that we will, next class, our focal point will be on depreciation uh, for most of the class. We will probably spend a bit of the class uh, going beyond depreciation. And just bear in mind that when we're done with chapter 14, we move right on to chapter 15. Okay. And if things fall into class, place, the next class, we will cover depreciation in maybe the first 10, 15 pages of chapter 15. In the final two classes, so that's next week, and then we have two more classes. We will finish chapter 15, and then our final, final class, well, we will cover chapter 19, okay? Dealing with timing issues. All right, so that gives you a perspective. Um, <clears throat> good news for your team is that uh, this course, because you guys took the, uh, took the plunge in late August, we finish up a bit earlier than most, okay? So hopefully that bodes well that um, you will have not a good Thanksgiving, but you will have a great Thanksgiving because you will be able to spend a lot of time studying tax. So, okay. so I, I see that as a win-win kind of thing. And I will be around for Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm not going away. So uh, if and when you guys have questions over that holiday weekend, uh, I will be there spiritually and I will be there physically to help you if you get stuck, okay? All right, so logistically, everyone has understands where we're going. Uh, any questions substantively on the material that we've covered? Okay, but guys, don't don't be bashful. In the next few weeks, all kidding aside, um, if you have questions, don't wait until the end. Now's the time to start really reviewing the material, and making sure you have a good handle of everything. Uh, do not wait until the end, okay? That's, um, now is the time to put it all together. All right, I'll pause for one second to say, aside from covering or following the election, anyone do anything interesting this weekend? Anything, anyone? Anyone get engaged? Ever <laughs> uh, since they, they, as she got engaged, we haven't seen her, I don't know. Karen, <laughs> uh, what did you do? Um, I volunteered at the Living Humane, and we had our. Uh, oh, do you do what? Volunteer at the I volunteer at the Living Humane Society on usually on Sunday, and we had our um, big fundraising thing on Big Hoboken. Where we had craft beer and whiskey tasting, and it was a really huge success. So it was, uh, it was for which Humane Society for dogs and cats? Yeah, Living Humane. Yeah, so Jersey City Hoboken. Uh, all right, good work, good work. Yeah, and I didn't know I liked Brian. 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 I liked Br
So we learned something new this week. <laughs> an, important, an important revelation. Maybe you want to just keep it that you volunteer for the Humane Society. There's some things that maybe I don't need to know. But okay. And, and were you going to say something, Nick? Yeah, how else would you tell us about the beer and whiskey problem? <laughs> well, I, I want to all over. I think I know. I, I, I did go, and I met friends. If you haven't been, I'll give you a, a quick recommendation. Sunday morning brunch. I had at uh, the Chart House in Weehawken, if you haven't been there. It's very nice, and it is not expensive. I mean, I think it's very reasonable per person to what you can pay. I mean, if you had that same meal in New York City, it would be easily double or triple. So uh, if you get a chance, Chart House in Weehawken on a summer, not a summer, a sunny, sunny day, it's pretty spectacular to look at, out at the uh, skyline there. <laughs> You're supposed to be there. You could have joined us. <laughs> they were booked. Well, now yeah, you know why. <laughs> <laughs> any, any movies or anything else to report? Anyone else do anything interesting? I know everyone's busy with tax. That's what I want to hear. All right. So let's, let's move on. Okay? Now. So we're going to talk about travel away from home, and um, this is the kind of thing, I, I, I mean this in a way that I'm trying to uh, make sure you're with me, this is, this, these questions are pertained for travel away from home, you can see, lend themselves to multiple choice questions for exam, okay, and these are the kind of questions that routinely come up in practice, right, it's not like, why is he asking us these questions? We'll never see them. No, to the contrary. I constantly get clients who will say, can I deduct that expense? Can I deduct that expense? And, and many of them pertain to travel expenses. So uh, hopefully you can pay close attention and see what's happening. All right, so bearing that in mind, uh, we have this frozen span case to lead off. So, um, I don't know, uh, let me ask Jeff, you have a chance to read this, you want to tell us about it? Yeah, um, so Rosenspan was a jewelry salesman and he didn't really have a home per se, he just he had relatives that he occasionally stayed with in a couple different cities. Yeah, I mean it's kind area. of sad, right Jeff, he's a widower, right? So. Kind of a sad case, he had kids, but doesn't seem to have a home, right, that he frequently goes to. He sort of uh, rents hotels room by JFK Airport. You know, not the kind of lifestyle you would probably want to emulate, right? And what happens here? So he, uh, he wants to deduct his travel expense. Um, the IRS disallows it because since he has no home, he can't be traveling away from home. Okay, so he wants to deduct all his travel expenses, and he wants to deduct the meals, lodging, all the other expenses, right? He wants to deduct it. We know, at least under current law, can you deduct, Mike, all your meals? Um, not all. What, what can you deduct in one kid? I guess you can't deduct groceries, right? That's the, that was one of the well, that's things. a different issue. That was whether or not Constitution 119 applied. Lewis, what am I referring to? Uh, you could deduct half your meals. Under what code section? Oh. Uh, <laughs> 274. 274 A, right? And one. Now, truth be told, they're deductible under 162, right? But 274 limits the deduction to 50%. So that's a better way of phrasing it, right? So, so by the way, Jeff, right? How does the IRS usually define home? Uh, I thought it was uh, based on where your your main place of work is. Yeah, usually the IRS defines home to be your business headquarters, right? Wherever you work. 
That's what the IRS traditional position is, right? And the taxpayer's position historically has been what? What does the word home mean? Where you live. It's kind of ironic in this case. What's the IRS position? That's where you live. In this position, the IRS reverse course when it was convenient for the agency to reverse course. And the IRS said, well, home here means the, tra the traditional sense, okay? And the taxpayer is the one who's arguing it means business headquarters, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, if, assuming you have the new edition at the bottom of page 385, I just call your attention because we'll, we'll see this again. There's a case uh, three lines up, four lines up. United States v. Corral. Everyone see that cross-reference? It's uh, four lines up on page 385 of the new edition. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll reference that again, but I just want to call that to your attention right now. All right, so, right, Jeff, now the court has set the parameters, set the framework in this case, and said, here's the IRS position, here's the taxpayer's position, and then it has to go through some analysis, right? And not surprisingly, the court does what courts often do. They start looking at other court decisions, right? That's typically, you know, uh, that's the whole notion of story decisis. Hey, we saw the law, other courts have viewed the law, we're gonna try to stay in line with other courts so there's consistency. And beginning on page 386, there's a discussion of um, Commissioner B. Flowers, right? Commissioner B. Flowers. And in Commissioner B. Flowers, the court points to three factors to consider, right? Mm -hmm. When is away from home going to be deductible? The expense must be reasonable and necessary. The expense must be incurred away from home. And here, the third factor is the most critical. The expense must be incurred in pursuit of business. This means there must be a direct connection between the expenditure and the carrying on of the trader business of the taxpayer or his employer. The court says that's the most important factor, right? Mm -hmm. That the reason this travel expense was incurred, it must be pursuant to business, right? Everyone see that? And the court said, you know what? It, it says almost the, the second test, that it must be away from home, it's almost the ancillary. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter how you define home, because the third, the third factor is so important. Are you really doing this as a way to make money, right? Is this, is this expense that you're incurring, you know, it takes money to make money. Is this expense um, in, in life, you know, does it measure up? And on page 387, it actually goes through the meaning of the word home. It says it's not entirely clear what the word home means. But again, it's not relevant. It, it's not irrelevant, but it's not going to make or break the taxpayer's case. And then it goes through several other cases looking at whether or not travel expenses are deductible, um, it does not, for our purposes, in this case, nor in any other case, is the word home technically ever defined. The court's not going to take a position. And who prevails here and why, Jeff? Uh, tax court and the appeals court both ruled against the taxpayer. Why? Because uh, <laughs> because of what you just said, where his expenses weren't really to generate business, it was <coughs> just his living expenses. Yeah, I mean these were 262 expenses, right? These are 262 expenses. Typically a taxpayer, when these expenses are deductible, it's in the kind of situation where there's some sort of duplication of expense. 
where picture each one of you are sent on a business trip, you have your home, condominium, apartment, and then you have to spend nights outside at a hotel, right? Uh, doing an audit, uh, doing some tax research, whatever the case may be, and notice the duplication of expense. And the duplication is usually a benchmark of deductibility. So here, the taxpayer is just incurring, for all intents and purposes, uh, ordinary living expenses. You had to live somewhere, you chose to live in a motel. All right, so the ruling or the court case, taxpayer loses. Right, Rose is bad. Does not prevail. Now we move on to the Andrews case. Ari, you have a chance to read it? Taxpayer living in Massachusetts, purchased a condo in Florida, and what happens? And then they had a, um, they had a two, two, uh, two lines of business, and then um, because the neighborhood um, at the uh, Florida became, uh, became unsafe, and then he, he moved to a single family uh, house, um, and then still keep a uh, separate line of business in Florida. Okay, what kind of line of business did he have in Florida? Uh, force, um, Horse breeding, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in Massachusetts, pools, right? He installed pools. Yes. Just to make everyone's life interesting here, he spent six months at each location, right? And he wants to deduct, if I'm not mistaken, his expenses in Florida, right? Right? He says, I'm away from home, treats Massachusetts as his home. And he wants to deduct expenses incurred when in Florida. Okay, it's being deductible. And the IRS says no, not deductible, right? No, it's a deduction. Do you recall what happens in tax court, Larry? Uh, so the tax court hold that um, the taxpayer were not away from home when the expenses were incurred. But finally, they, um, um, the judge said um, the living expenses incurred uh, while on business at Florida, a Florida house should have been an allowable uh, deduction. All right, all right, let's slow down. Let's take it slowly. Tax court rules that the taxpayer had two homes, right? Not one, but two homes. And therefore, the taxpayer couldn't be away from either, right? This is uh, page 393. The tax court concluded that Andrew had two tax homes. By the way, if this makes anyone feel better, I may have mentioned one of my favorite words. It's the word schadenfreude, uh, which if you don't know what that word means, is being sort of joy at the misfortunes of others. Okay. You know, German word. what was that, Alicia? It's a German word. It's a German word. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think many of you can get us in. If you ever saw the uh, show Avenue Q, they had a whole song named Shadow for you. Anyway, but if it makes you feel any better because this is tough material, here's an educated tax court judge who gets it completely wrong, okay? Because there's no way you can have two tax homes. And even the IRS, when this goes to appeals, says, well, the tax court got it wrong, okay? And how the, how the, how the IRS is the one who is pushing on the tax court this notion of two homes. So if you're saying, gee, this gets confusing, keep in mind, you're a good company, all right? Um, a lot of people, apparently, great people, are getting it wrong, all right? 
So again, when it goes up to the upper court, um, <coughs> the IRS acknowledges that's a mistake and has to debate what is the tax code. Now, if you look up page 395, the last full paragraph on page 395, the paragraph that begins this court, okay, this court, uh, five or six lines down says, where business necessity requires that a taxpayer maintain two places of abode and thereby incur additional and it duplicated <coughs> living expenses. Such duplicative expenses are cost of producing income and should ordinarily be deducted. Okay, so <coughs> this notion of duplication of expenses are certainly a bellwether for deductibility. <coughs> On what basis, Larry, are we going to judge what's deductible and what's not? Um, it needs to be reasonable and necessary, and needs to be well away from home, and also needs to um, really incur the pursuit of business. Well, we know he's he's pursuing business, right? He's pursuing Massachusetts. He's pursuing it in Florida. Agree. How are, we, how are we going to decide which expenses are deductible, Larry? Or how does the court go about it? Um, I think um, we need to decide where is the um, primary place of residence. Uh, primary post of duty is the phraseology. This is on page 397. The only paragraph on page 397. Four or five lines down on page 397. The guiding policy must be that the taxpayer is reasonably expected to locate his quote unquote home for taxpayer and his major post of duty so as to minimize the amount of business travel away from home that is required. A decision to do otherwise is motivated not by business necessity but by personal considerations and should not give rise to greater business travel deductions. Then if you look, I believe towards the end of class, I directed your attention to footnote uh, 10. How do you figure out what is a major and minor post of duty? In that footnote, it says, here's an objective list. It includes three factors. The length of time spent at each location, the degree of activity, and the relative portion of the taxpayer's income, right? What does the court do in this instance then? It says, well, remember, the appeals court is not a fact finder. Agreed? The appeals court is not a fact finder. So what ends up happening? It remains it to the lower court. It says, here's the law. You guys blew it. Based on this law, what are the facts? Where is this taxpayer's major or minor post of duty, right? That's what happens. Do we know how this case was ultimately resolved? Do you have any guess, Wes, what might have happened? It's still open. Mm -hmm. Say again? How do you? It's still open. Still open? Man, yeah, this happened in 1984. Probably not. <laughs> Wes, do you have an idea? Um, I would think the fact that the lower tax court reversed the rule and it's said it to do that. Well, what do you really think happened? Jackie, what do you think happened here? The, the meals and costs were, were allowable because Florida was the second home when the expenses were. Well, do you think this ever got back to tax court? Is my question. Uh, I don't remember. What, what do you think really happened here, guys? You guys all have hopefully vivid imaginations. Because I'm not sure, so this is pure conjecture on my part. So this is a heck of a it bit is, well, probably what happened is the IRS and taxpayers said, based on these factors, let's see if we can just settle. Because each side would have to spend, I mean, the taxpayer would have probably had to spend another twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 on legal fees. And the IRS would have had to spend 100 man or woman hours trying to resolve this. So they could and likely did resolve it informally. In other words, many times, when the, when the higher court remands it back, 
There's no requirement if the parties are willing to settle, they could have settled and moved on. And I, I would imagine that's what happened or else if it had gone back to court, our, our authors, I think, would have told us that it went back to court and here's the final resolution. But many, many cases that are remanded, my point is to you, my point is that many times they're probably informally settled. And that's true before it ever gets to court. What percentage of cases get to the court? Probably of every 100 cases, probably two or three get to, the, get to court. 95% of them get settled or resolved before it goes to court. Because litigation is expensive, right guys? Everyone good? So Andrew's just trying to say, if you have two places in the business, see where the major and minor post of duty is, right? And it gives you those three factors to consider. <coughs> Revenue ruling 99 7 talks about circumstances where people are traveling between taxpayers' residence and work location, and in what, what circumstances they will be deductible. Okay, so some of you, your job may have to travel to temporary work locations. So, for example, if you're a physician or your client's physician, and he or she has to normally works in an office, but also has to go to the hospital, which is temporary work location. Depending on circumstances, may have this revenue rolling, be able to deduct those expenses under 99 So look, on page 400, it leaves three propositions on page 400. The taxpayer may deduct daily transportation expenses incurred in going between the taxpayer's residence in temporary work locations outside the metropolitan area where the taxpayer lives and only works. <coughs> Um, and let me just, you don't know this, this ruling was issued almost uh, 20 years ago, right? It's been, been a while. Um, subsequent court decisions say, that in this ruling they define what is a metropolitan area. Just picture, if you will, if you're a carpenter and you had to go from your home to various places, right? Remember, let's, let's take a step back. With respect to travel expenses, maybe I asked you this towards the end of last class. If you live, um, say, in, uh, everyone know where Livingston, New Jersey is? It's not far from here. You live in Livingston, New Jersey, and you work in Newark, right? And why do you drive to Newark? Because you have a job here, right? You might say, hey, I, I know that I'm spending money on gas, and I'm spending that money on gas. Why am I spending it? To make money. I have to get to work, right? Everyone agree? So in theory, might someone argue that expense should be deductible, right? Because I'm only filling up my gas tank because I have to get to work every day. Everyone agree? Is that, Stephanie, is that expense deductible? No. Why not? How would you label that? Because it's not from your business headquarters. You're not leaving from your business headquarters. So. Well, put a label on it. What would you call that kind of expense? A personal expense. Personal expense under white code section. Um, 262, right? Yeah. Because, right, Stephanie, if you lived in Livingston, that was your choice. You could live in downtown Newark, right? You chose to live out. Otherwise, you could have walked. You know, walk to work. You can live in the building maybe you work in, right? So anytime there's commuting expenses, right, guys? By their nature, they're personal expenses. Agreed? <coughs> but if you're a carpenter and you have to go to multiple job locations, right? 
you're not doing, you can't live at 10 different job locations, agree? So that gives an aroma of deductibility. It's not your choice not to live at a job location. You can't live there because you have to travel between and among those job locations, right? So it just, bear in mind, every time you look at a travel expense, right, it's definitely you gotta think to yourself, deductible because it's necessary, or is it a personal choice, right? And look, you can read 99-7 for yourself. I will add on page 401, it says, for purposes of paragraphs one, two, and three, the following are plans determining whether work location is temporary. If employment at a work location is realistically new, like realistically expected to last, and does in fact last for one year or less, the employment is temporary in the absence of facts indicating to the contrary. If, it, um, if employment at a work location is realistically expected to last more than one year, or there is no realistic expectation that employment will last for one year or less, the employment is not temporary, regardless whether it actually exceeds one year. So temporary means less than one year. Something that's deemed permanent is more than one year, right? Then it says, if employment at work location initially is expected to last for one year or less, that is temporary, but at some later point in time, the employment is realistically expected to exceed one year, that employment will be treated as temporary until the date the taxpayer realistically, realistic expectation changes, it will be treated as permanent after that date. And we're gonna see this come up in the problem. All right, so what's the takeaway with travel away from home? The takeaway again is if you look at the Flowers decision, which is the Flowers decision is embedded in the Rosenspan decision, is the expense incurred pursuant to your trade or business, right? Don't get caught up on this notion of what is home. Are you incurring that expense? The rationale behind incurring that expense associated with um, your trade or business. So let's, let's begin on page 401. These are good problems. These are the kind of problems that come up in practice. Commuter owns a home office, <coughs> a home in the suburb of the city, he drives to the city each day, eats lunch at various restaurants in the city. Okay? So if you don't mind, we'll have this person live in Livingston again. Again, those who don't know Livingston, it's about 20 minutes outside of Newark on uh, the Route 280 car. Okay? So picture, if you will, you're living in Livingston, you're driving to Newark. Uh, and you're eating at, uh, uh, I don't know, anyone have a favorite restaurant in Newark these days? Pornos. Pornos, Pornos. Mm -hmm. Not gonna work for me as a vegetarian, but what the heck. You're eating at Pornos. <laughs> May commuter deduct his cost of transportation and or eat uh, What do you, Louise, you say no? No. Why not? Uh, I'm sorry, you say, say it loud? He can choose to, to walk in, to, to live in the city. That was his first to live in the suburb, right? He's, he's yeah. living in Livingston, commuting to Newark. Uh, he works in Newark, he eats at four days. Can he deduct any of those expenses? Uh, and why not? What was the question? Personal, personal expense under what? 262. 262, right? Everybody agree? Mm -hmm. Non-deductible personal expense. Agree? Agree. And what about, Johanny, uh, the case where the commuter is an attorney, often must travel between his office and city courthouse, file papers, try cases, make commuter deduct any or all of his transportation and meals. Johanny, what do you say? I'm 
sorry? Is, Go ahead. Is he allowed to go meals? Can you, let's start with travel expenses. I would say no. No? Zach, you agree? Uh, yeah, I would agree. And what's your rationale? Uh, it's, I'm sorry? Uh, it's, it's still under that personal expense. Okay, but keep in mind, he has an office in, in Newark, and he has to travel across town to file papers at the courthouse. Can he, even if he, theoretically, he chose to have his home right next to his office, right? He might still have to drive to the courthouse, right? That's driven by, no pun intended, driven by business necessity, right? So he can't, you're absolutely right, you're having exact, he can't deduct, excuse me, the expenses with associated with traveling from his home to the office. But if he travels from the office to the courthouse to conduct work, that's not a personal choice, right? So those expenses would be deductible. <coughs> Um, both? I would think travel would be deductible and the meals would not. And the meals would not. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, the meals, there was not a rationale for deducting the meals here. Everyone's got to eat. Bust up. So if you're self employed, you can't deduct meals? Well, I don't want to say you can't deduct meals, but you can't deduct meals unless you're on business. Okay? And here, and we'll get a refinement. Alicia? Say it loudly. Uh, so you work, you have good practice, and you have well practice, but you're also a professor. So because you have two jobs, you cannot deduct transportation to one of the jobs, or you can? Why couldn't I? You have two different jobs, right? So you can. You can't have a house next to both jobs. Okay. You could deduct travel expenses between locations. Okay. All right. How about question C? A uh, commuter resides and works in city, but occasionally must fly to other city uh, business for his employer. He eats lunch in other cities. So, picture you will drives from Livingston Newark Airport and has business say in Phoenix. Okay. And it's a long day, he flies out to Phoenix, meets a client, has lunch with the client, then flies back, okay? And, uh, excuse me, he doesn't have lunch with the client, he just has lunch by himself in the other city. And he flies back in, in the early afternoon, uh, in the late afternoon, early evening. What can he deduct? They deduct the transportation? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Everyone agree? Deduct the transportation. What about lunch? Whether it be at McDonald's or, you know, Zen Burgers or wherever you want to pick up. Okay, you deduct 50%. I'm thinking, I'm thinking two All right. I'm going to tell you, you want to know this. But you remember that USB Carroll case I pointed out on page 385? The Supreme Court said for you to be able to deduct meals, if you're not meeting with clients, you have to be away overnight. Okay? In other words, if you're just having a meal, you don't have to eat, right? The fact that you're not away overnight is suggesting you could brown bag it, right? Theoretically. Could have brought, right? You asked your peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You know, you could brought, bring your bottle of water, but the peanut butter and jelly is still viable, right? Um, so, U.S.B. Carroll says that with respect to meals, okay, not deductible. If you're meeting with a client, it's a different kind of issue. But here, just having lunch by yourself is not deductible. It's a personal expense, 262. If he would travel overnight, he does If it was travel overnight, then the meals would be deducted. Only half or everything? I'm sorry? Only half? Half, half. When I see meals are deductible, deductible subject to the 50% limitation. Okay. So. 
Right, so the next step is eating by himself is 50% of the duck. If he's eating the, uh, hold on, what's happening? If he's eating by himself the next day, he can duck. Did he sleep over? Yeah. Yes. And then if, if he's with a client the next day, he's taking them out, then he can duck. Right, I mean, he, he could be with client or not. As long as he goes overnight, that meals, when he's away from home, would be duck. Okay, all right? Okay, question two. Taxpayer lives with her husband and children in city. Okay, let's say good old Newark. Uh, so they're living in Newark and work there, okay? If employer sends her to Philadelphia on business for two days and one night each week, the taxpayer is not reimbursed for expenses, what may she deduct? So suppose Taxpayer lives here in downtown New York and has to spend two days, uh, two days and one night each week um, in Philadelphia. What do we say is deductible? James, what do you think? Uh, you can deduct travel and meals since you're staying overnight. So travel, right? Code section 162. Uh, here we have a major post of duty. Of duty, presumably in Newark, minor post in Philadelphia. And the meals, because it's overnight, USB Carroll would permit that. Subject right, caveat to the 50% limitation. Code section 274N1, right, Fausto? Yes. Yes. If that travel would continue on for over a year, does it matter? Oh, say it slowly? If that travel. No, that's okay. That's a different issue. Okay. So so it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Okay, because it's not okay. Now let's switch it up. Go ahead, Larry. Well, transportation is there 2%? Sorry? All this, or any time an employee incurs this expense, it's all subject to the 2% miscellaneous itemized deduction under Code Section 67. But if he gets reimbursement, there's no. There's no limitation. And then the employer can deduct it. Question B, same as A, except that she works three days and spends two nights each week in Metro and maintains an apartment there. What is the author's, what are the authors attempting to do, uh, Jesse, with respect to this fact pattern? Why are they raising this fact pattern? Yes. They're indirectly raising the Andrews case, right, Nick? And they're, they're calling it and raising without resolving. You know, what would you look at to decide the major and minor post of duty, right? You would want to see um, how much money is made at each location, length of time, all different things. Wherever the major post of duty is, not deductible. Where the minor post of duty is, those living expenses would be deductible and 50% of the meals. Right? And we can't resolve that tonight because we're not given enough facts. So I'm not purposely trying to make your notes ambiguous, but the authors are trying to <coughs> raise these questions. Question 2C. Back there, the husband owned a home in the city, and husband works there. Taxpayer works in Metro, maintaining a apartment there. So picture, taxpayer and her husband own a home in Newark. The husband works there. Taxpayer works in Philadelphia, maintaining an apartment there. And she travels to Newark each weekend to visit her husband, right? Very romantic. What may she deduct? That's how they keep their marriage together, right? Yeah, uh, where are the kids? Good question. Uh, Jia Ying. What do you say? What's deductible or not deductible? Not deductible. Why not? Because um, she works in Metro by maybe like five days a week. So, yeah, I don't think the travel to the city is deductible. Why not? What's your authority? Um, personal. Uh, but section 262, 262, right? It's her choice, right? 
This is, does it require that she travel to Newark to see her husband, right? Only her choice, good for her, but doesn't earn a deduction. Right? Early, professional football player, city stoppers, in his way going to a home in Metro where they reside during a seven month quote unquote off season. And Early's only source of income, so let's say he's a football player for the Jets, right? Who I think many of you know they have in Florida Park, they have their their whole um, practice and training. Um, I, I had a client there once and I have to tell you, it was the most incredible gym I've ever seen in my life. Um, very impressive. They have three different football fields there uh, to replicate like a turf field, an outdoor field, and some other field. I don't know what the theory was. So it was a, a very, very impressive uh, regime. It's right on Park Avenue, if you guys know Florin Park. Um, and, and the uh, parking lot outside looked like a new car dealership with every fancy exotic car you can imagine. Right? Uh, so Burley's, Burley's a football player for the Jets, and he is and his wife own a home in Florham Park, let's say. Um, oh, hold on. So let's say they, 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 he has a home in Florham Park, and they have a home also in say Miami, where they reside during the seven month off season, okay? So he spends five months up here in Jersey, seven months in Miami. Everyone get the visual? Uh -huh. The Burley's only source of income is his salary from the Jets. They uh, early deduct any of his uh, foreign park living expense, which he incurs during the football season. So he maintained two, <coughs> two homes and he just travels up here. Uh, <coughs> Nick, other side, Nick, what do you think? Did that support or not? Um, I would say no, it's not deductible. Why not? Uh, because at that time when he travels to the field, that's almost like him going to his work from his from his home. Right. So therefore, like, it would be a way to like to get around the rules if you did that. Yeah, it's in a realm of being a personal expense. Right? Yeah, two sixty-two. Okay, and no. would there be any difference above if during the seven month off season, Burley worked so worked out in Miami as an insurance salesman? With this, uh, Diana, did this make it deductible? Any of it? So he's not a football player anymore. No, he's a football player. And he also didn't pick up a second job. Yeah. <laughs> now the, the ten million dollars made that year. Just ten million enough. doesn't go as far as it used to, right? <laughs> yeah. Just isn't enough. You know, I have to say, many and maybe this is a male thing versus a female thing. So, but I think it, it, the male part of it is everyone would like to be an athlete, okay, and, and get that shiny glamour of being an athlete, but and have the lights focus on you that. You know, fame and whatnot. But you know, you turn age 35 and you can't play anymore because that's just life. And it must be very hard psychologically to adjust when you're used to having 70,000 fans screaming for you. So I know you're, you're, you're. I don't know if anyone's heart goes out to the athletes who, you know, probably made 100 million during their career and now have to give up the limelight. But psychologically, that must be. Very tough, though. Yeah, it's tough when you're your eyes and punch out bills all the way. Yeah, it's, that, that makes it tough. Especially like Pete Manning when he's got so that all the endorsements. That's true. He has a lot of endorsements. But anyway, moving on. Uh, and the Ducks point or not? What, where does your brain go? How are you going to frame this? Because definitely if he has a home there, it's kind of, could be like a vacation home. But it isn't. He's working selling insurance. 
assuming it's a legitimate business, Nick. His major statement is public service. So you want to look at his major or minor post of duty, and here it gets confusing. Because on one hand, he's going to make 90% of his income in New Jersey, 10% down in Florida, but he's spending seven months out of 12 down in Florida, right? Is that great? So it's not going to be easy, right, to determine major or minor post of duty, agreed? Uh, but theoretically, and uh, uh, the travel expenses between those locations should be deductible wherever his minor post of duty is, right? He, he's going there not for fun. If he's going there for fun, that's not deductible. If he sells one policy a year, that to me is not going to be considered a minor post of duty. He can't. So it's got to be a legitimate business that he's really uh, undertaking in Florida. But then, wherever his minor post of duty is, he can deduct the travel expenses getting there, and then um, the cost of the meals, subject again to the 50% limitation, and the you know, lodging expenses and the like. Diana? So if he has his home there, would he be able to deduct it also? Instead of having a hotel, he has the house. Do you use that with real estate taxes? Yeah, you can deduct real estate tax. It's depreciation on the house. It's a, it's a, you know, that's, again, look at the Andrews case. What he tried to deduct. Okay. Go ahead there. So then, for like uh, part A, I guess that would be his like major post. Well, with A, there's no minor post at all because he he right, wasn't. That's his only. Right, right. It's moved. Right, right. Question four, Karen. What if you, it's not a personal choice if you, you have to live where you live because, like, I work in Manhattan and I can't afford to live in Manhattan, so I have to live somewhere else. No? You can't. No, no, no. Because I'm sure there's some closet in Manhattan you can live in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you chose, you want more than you know, 10 square feet to live in, but that's your choice. You don't need a bathroom, you just need to hang upside down on the rack. Alicia. We're talking about the closet in Manhattan. In Japan, in Tokyo, they have actually overnight like a sleeping Hot. arrangement that looks like a coffin kind of. Yeah. They put you into this pod, yeah. Yeah, in, in so Tokyo they have these pods that you can sleep in. Yeah. I've seen pictures of those. Has anyone <laughs> gone to Tokyo and slept in a pod? I wonder how soundproof they are. I could do it, I think, if I didn't hear the person next to me snore. <laughs> By the way, I know you're talking about Tokyo and pods, and maybe it's just because I never want to spend that much money, but has anyone gone on a cruise ship and gone to the lower tiers? I mean, the rooms that you sleep in on many cruise ships are not bigger than maybe pods. They're pretty, I mean, I remember being where you go like this and touch the walls on each side. And they're pretty small. Living arrangements. How like the ship on the side? How the living arrangements on the Navy ship? You literally sleep on a rack that's as big as wide as a table. Is that what it is? If you sit up face up, you get your head on either the rack above you or the ceiling. Sounds like fun. No. I assume that you, you spent a few nights on that ship. I didn't have to. Um, I was stateside, but uh, most of my friends did. I've been on a couple of ships, but I didn't spend that. Okay. Um, question four. Temporary. Works for an employer in city where temporary and his family live. So picture for you all temporary. Um, working in, and living in Newark. Mm -hmm. Employer has trouble with branch office, say in Philadelphia. She has temporary to go to branch office for nine months. Tem temporary family stays in Newark and he rents an apartment in Philadelphia. Are right, those expenses deductible incurred there? Tina, what do you think? Yes. Let's say it loudly. That's loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we do allow to be deducted? Um, 
good. The travel expense is getting there, the rent incurred, and meals subject to 50% limitation, right? And question 4B, what results in A above? The time period is expected to be nine months, but after eight months, it's extended to 15 months. In that case, Katie, what do you say? I was going to say yes, but now it seems like no. And what does yes mean? That they can do that So how, what, what do you think? What was your revelation? And Rafi, I'll see if you agree with Katie. Well, I just feel like it was eight, and then it's not going to be more than 15. So it was do what, though? Deduct the same thing he was deducting for the eight months. So, could so you deduct the entire? He's going to be away. Let's do our arithmetic. Um, over a year. 15 months. Can he deduct all 15? Can he deduct up to 12? Can he deduct only eight months of expenses? Yes, okay. up to 12. Up to 12. Raphael, do you agree? Uh, I'm not sure. Not sure? Uh, Zach, you have a. Uh, wouldn't it be you can deduct for the first eight months? Uh, months 9 through 15, you can. Right, that's what it is. That's what that revenue rolling 99-7, Katie, that segment that I read you, said you can, as long as up to the point that you think you're going to be away temporarily, you can deduct. But any point beyond that is non-deductible. What are the rules of the 99-7. Question 4C. Our result in A above, separating his family and lived in the furnished apartment in Newark, and he and his family gave up the apartment, moved to Philadelphia, where they lived in a furnished apartment for nine months. So, Mr. Anetta, what would you deduct here? Also, nine months left in a year. Just say it loudly because there's lots of people behind you. I'll deduct the rent and the travel expenses. You deduct the rent and travel expenses. Jackie, you're way up there, so let's. I would say no because they gave up the apartment, so we so have their like principal place of residence. So there's no duplication of expenses, right, yeah. Jackie? Mm -hmm. So at this point, expenses they incur are personally personal living expenses. So here, once there's in the elimination of duplication, uh, these expenses then would not be deductible. They would all be personal, 263. So if you're moving because of work, you can't If you're moving because of work, but you think it's better to be down in Philadelphia, that's your choice. But do not maintain two, two abodes any longer. Okay? The notion is typically you can deduct it temporarily away from home because you're not going to, most people, right, aren't going to move, right, for nine months. Agreed? Mm -hmm. uh, so you can deduct those expenses traveling there because there's no expectation on the part of Congress you're going to move. But if, the, if they say you have to spend four years at a, at a temporary, so-called temporary job location, Congress's expectation is you should move for those four years. And the fact you don't move at that point is a personal decision. So it makes it non deductible under 262. All right, question five before Warren is one of my favorite questions in terms of what you should know for exam, because these are the kind of things that come up. So let's see if you guys can hone in and match it. Traveler. Flies from her personal tax home in New York to a business meeting on, in Florida on a Monday. Um, trip or the meeting ends late Wednesday. She flies home on Friday afternoon after two days in the sunshine. Okay? And everyone can picture this because maybe you've been there, done this, right? To what extent are the transportation, meals, and lodging deductible? So, just for argument's sake, guys, let's just play with some numbers just to make sure that we're on the same wavelength. So just uh, for argument's sake, let's just say the airfare round trip is $900. So 
say lodging is $100 a night for lodging, and say meals are $40 a night, okay? $40 a day, okay? Let me keep my mouth shut for one minute. Everyone, come up with a number of what you say is deductible. What's deductible? I'm the client, these are the facts. Come up with a number of what you say is deductible. Regulation 162-2B, which you 
should open up this one. We're going to have regulation 162-2K. What does it, it say? If the taxpayer travels to a destination, and why it says destination engages in both business and personal activities, which is us, right? Mm -hmm. Travel expenses to and from such destination are deductible only if the trip is related primarily to the taxpayer's trade or business. What the heck does primarily mean? If a trip is primarily personal in nature, the travel expenses to and from are not deductible, even though the taxpayer engages in business activities while at the destination. However, expenses while at the de de destination um, are properly allocable to the taxpayer's trade or business are deductible. Now, look at B2. Whether a trip is related primarily to the taxpayer's business or primarily personal nature depends on the facts and circumstances in each case, right? Mm -hmm. The amount of time during the period the trip is spent on personal compared to the amount of time of activities uh, directly relating, uh, related, relating to the taxpayer's trade or business is an important factor in determining whether the trip is primarily personal. If, for example, a taxpayer spends one week at a destination on activities which are directly related to his trade or business, and subsequently spends an additional five weeks <laughs> for vacation, the trip will be considered primarily personal. So you get next? In this case, it's so fully done. The airfare should probably be deductible. Everyone agree? Because it's primarily business, but I just did a Four week junket and they only had two days business, not deductible. I read it right? <clears throat> so, airfare is deductible. What about the logic? How many nights? James? Three. Say again, James? Three. All right. I can see your answer being two or three, depending on not how late. The business trip ended on Wednesday, right? Yeah. Because you can't force a person if the business trip ended, say, at seven o'clock at night, try to get to Miami or airport for the last flight. It might not work, right? So I could see where we're going to allow three hundred dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And then meals. Three days. One twenty. Divided by two, right, is 60. So um, we could say 1,260 did. There we go. We got a winner. Now look, I can see how you can get other answers too. Those who said 1,160, I can see justification there too. All right? The hotel is the full amount, right? The hotel is the full amount. We got that? Anyone um, married in this crowd? Nikisha. Yes. Okay, Nikisha, you get question um, 5B. Okay? You bring your husband, okay? on a business trip because, no offense to you, Nikisha, uh, he's a wheeler dealer, and when he's with you, uh, clients just swarm over because he's got the, the right touch, right? So he's critical when you're at business meetings because he's got a charm pizzazz, and whenever he's there, literally sales double, okay? So when you go away, you bring him because He's such an intricate part of the business. Can we deduct his travel? Uh, we cannot, and we've actually done that. <laughs> what do you mean we've done it? I don't know. Like, I've um, been <coughs> only a few times to work, and I went with him. And you went with him? Yes. 
and you did not deduct his expenses. No, I can't. Right, what's your authority? Um, personal, just having more. Okay, 274 what? 274 says a lot. 274 F3. Right? 274 F3 puts significant breaks on the deductibility of your spouse's expenses, right? 274M3. Okay. Only if certain very hard conditions are met can you deduct your spouse's presence, but 99.999% of the time you're never going to meet all these conditions. What result in A above the traveler stays in Florida until Sunday afternoon? Go ahead, Nick. I would say you can't deduct it at that point because it's not primarily business. Yeah. All right. Nick says you can't deduct it because it's not primarily business. So when you say these you could deduct, but you're saying the airfare would be non deductible. Right? Yes. Can you make an argument? Can you fashion an argument, uh, Mike or Wes, to say it's deductible? Yeah, I mean, it's still a week I deduct it. Under what theory? Um, I mean, Monday to Friday, Monday to Sunday is very yeah. arbitrary. It's just a portion. Well, what would you argue, perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, some employers say, look, we don't want you to leave out on Friday because the airfare is triple. But if you leave on Sunday, let's just suppose, just use your imagination, maybe the airfare is not a business travel day, is 90% less, so we want you to travel on a Sunday. Maybe it's business driving, all right? Not clear. But Nick's point is well taken. This trip now has more of a personal aroma. Everybody agree? And if it's personal, it's not deductible, right? Now, let me just also ask you, does anyone here do much business travel? Anyone? James, you do. Um, when you go, do you go typically coach, business class, or first class? Coach. Coach. If you go first class, okay, so picture, James, you have a trip to Europe. Instead of being $900, that trip, right, James, could be $9,000, okay, or some very expensive amount. Is that $9,000 deductible? Yes. Yes. James? Yeah. Why? <coughs> Say again? Because for business. For business. It's for business. Okay, but I mean, the notion is why does Congress permit where the deduction for coaches 900, business class 9,000? What is the policy reason behind Congress permitting such a robust deduction in that context? Isn't that a business judgment by your employer, or you, if you're a proprietorship notion? Meaning, hey, you're not going to Europe for fun, you're going for business. And this makes you more relaxed and on top of your game, right, by getting a good night's sleep uh, in business class. And it's worth it. That's a, your choice for business, right? You're spending money to make money. The government is not going to second guess whether or not you know, it should be coach or first class. Some people might say, look, I, I can't sleep in coach, and I really need to be fresh. I have three meetings one day at the ground in Paris, right? So even though you're, you might say, gee, it should be deductible, Congress doesn't put brakes on that, OK? Everybody agree? OK, I have a question. Alicia, just say it loudly. Coming back to C. Uh, we read that Regulation 1, 162 b it says that if our trip is primarily for personal and we do some business, we can still deduct some meals and lodging. Yes. yes. So in number C, Letter C, we would still be able to... Deduct the lodging and then 50% of the meals yes, okay. for those days spent in business. Okay. Okay? Suppose instead, uh, question A, traveler takes a cruise ship, leaving Wednesday, 
um, we just on Wednesday night and arriving in New York. So now you're going to take a cruise ship. Okay? Are those travel expenses deductible? Are those travel expenses deductible? In this case. Anna, what do you say? So instead, you take a plane one way, you take a cruise ship back. Uh, say it loudly. I would think it's deductible. You think it's deductible? And Jessica, do you agree? <coughs> James? I don't think a cruise ship is deducted all the way back unless it's the only necessary transportation back here. So you're not going to deduct the cloud deduction unless it's necessary, but it's not necessary, Larry? Um, I think there's a coal section talking about the water transportation. That's 274M1. All right, 274, James, 274M1 says you want to go by water transportation, which is generally much more expensive, right, than an airplane, okay? You can take a deduction, but they're gonna cap the deduction at twice what's called the federal per diem rate. So if the federal per diem rate, say, is $100 a day, you can deduct, relating to your water transportation fee, up to $200 a day, okay? So if you choose, suppose, some people are afraid to get on planes, right? They can only, go, only by, go by train or boat, right? And if that's you, Congress says, okay, you can deduct it, but you can't, if you want to save the presidential suite, suite of the boat, the Michael Jackson suite, um, you can't deduct the $15,000 per night, okay? It's going to be capped at twice the federal per diem rate. Have any of you stayed at the Atlantis Hotel? Okay. So did you look up and see the Michael Jackson suite? No. Oh, did you have, I mean, if you know the Atlantis Hotel, um, you always see it in advertisements, right? That they have these two huge buildings and then they have a bridge between the buildings. Yeah. And the, supposedly this is the Michael Jackson suite that costs $15,000 a night between the two. Um, if you haven't been to the Atlantis, I'm, I'm not into like vacations that have all this glitter. That's not my style. But I did spend four days there. I was, I don't know, Katie, I was very impressed. I did, by the way, Katie, I did not stay at the Atlantis. If you want a little <laughs> secret here, here's the secret. And I kid you not, if you Google it, you can stay next door at the Comfort Suite Inns for one third the money. You get a wristband, and you're allowed to all the activities on the premises of the Atlantis. And to me, I don't care where I sleep. I want to have the facilities. So I was really impressed by what the ingenuity of the rides that they have, the water plumes and all yeah, that. Yeah, it's really well done. It's really impressive. So if you want to make it affordable, um, go stay at the Comfort Suites. So Comfort Suites can you have James, they get, did they have a, a relationship with uh, they, No. By the way, the Comfort Suites really dumpy. Okay. And and you're going to pay more money than you ever paid for Comfort Suites. It's not, you know, where you're going to pay eighty dollars a night for Comfort Suites. It's like three hundred dollars a night. But that gives you an idea of how expensive the Atlantis is. The cheap rooms at the Atlantis, right, Katie? I know they have all yeah, these. I stayed in like the, one, like the first built. It was like really old. It was like all the way on the side. Right. And, yeah. It was and it was very cheap. expensive, I'm yeah. sure. And I mean, you can see ads, and you're like, oh, it's going to be pretty cheap if you go. But that, that's when, if you want to go, if, like the second week in January, where you can't get off from work, that's when the cheap <laughs> prices come in. You want to go anytime when it's when you want to go. 
then it's like through the roof cost. So if you want to go, definitely go or consider going to Comfort Suites before when it's not great. But again, if you don't care and you just want a bed and a mattress and you really want to go for the activities, that's my kind of vacation. And you can eat, yeah. And you can eat at the Atlantis, yeah. yeah. It's, you know, again, you're not, I, I'm not a foodie. Okay? So for me, it was just, I wanted the experience of you know, testing out the Atlantis. So if you want, I think, Katie, right, four days is enough. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I'm not all inclusive here. Yeah, you're done. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not. That, that's not my style usually, but it was interesting because they do have some interesting rides that really um, I've never seen anywhere else. All right. So I guess this is a cruise ship, and it would be deductible but subject to these limitations under 274s. Okay. Question A. What result in A if the tra traveler's trip is now to Mexico City? Off we go, Mexico City. And um, the airfare is 900. Uh, same, same deal, okay? Same taxes in A. What do people say? All right, you get your beer bearings? No, uh, I'm sure. You sure? Uh, Larry, Tina, what do you guys say? What's the next one, what's not? <laughs> there's a there's a cold section at 274 C. That's for foreign travel. Okay, it might be relevant. Last I check. I was saying what Donald Trump might say, Mexico is not part of the United States, so this would be foreign travel, right? So what do you say, Larry? What do you say, Tina? What do you say, Stephanie, Jesse, Baby? The doctor or not? Deductible, but you have to allocate the travel expenses to the um, days um, for business and uh, personal. Mm. All right. So that is do a pro rata based on the number of days spent in business versus personal. Why? Because he says, if you read C1, it says, in the case of any individual who travels outside the United States away from home in pursuit of trade or business, Okay. No deduction shall be allowed under Code Section 162 or Section 212 for that portion. Underline the word portion. Everyone underline the word portion. For that portion of the expenses of such travel, otherwise allowable under said section, which under the regulations prescribed by the Secretary, is not allocable to such trade or business or to such activity. So that means if it's personal, that portion is disallowed. So Larry says, gee, three days business, two days personal. I'll just, Larry, can I put words in your mouth? Larry might say, take this 900, and what would be deductible would be three fifths. Right, everyone, if you looked at code section 274C1, that seems to be what it's indicating, agree? But because we are all masters of the code, none of us in this room would stop reading here, right, Larry? We would read the exception. Especially because you never know when that's going to bite you, excuse my language, bite you in the ass, OK? <laughs> and Larry, as you read ahead, it says paragraph 1 shall not apply to the expenses of any travel outside the United States if that travel does not exceed one week. <laughs> oh, damn it. That means that rule does not apply, which means I get to erase the three fifths, and I get to deduct the full 900. And just for your edification, look at the second exception. The portion of time outside the United States away from Rome, which is not attributable to the pursuit of the taxpayer's trade or business, is less than 25% of the total time of such travel. So if you go away, say, um, to um, China on business, you're going to be there two weeks, OK? Individual, two weeks. Um, let me do my arithmetic. Two weeks, as I checked, is 14 days. In two days, you spend traveling the Great Wall, right? 
Yeah. Anyone have their calculator out? I didn't do this before class, but um, that means 12 out of 14 days you were spent in business, right? What percentage it teaches you you're, you're multiplying it, right? I can't see this far. 85, 85.7. 85, 86% uh, round up. 86% of the time would be spent in business. You know, if you're going away on borrowed travel for more than a week, and you're spending a day or two of your trip, or something less than 25% of personal, Congress says, okay, we're not gonna, you know, how many times are you gonna be in China to walk the Great Wall, right? So we'll allow the person to get the full travel deduction, right? It's trying to be reasonable. So everyone with everyone see the the rule under 274C1, the general limitation, and then there's two exceptions to that, right? One is if the trip is less than a week, and the second is if just spend a little time checking out the Great Wall, right? Okay, bearing that in mind, look at question F. Take two minutes. Let, let, by the way, let's finish up these problems and then we'll take our break. So, give me, give me a few more minutes and we'll take our break. Question F. What result in E above if the traveler went to Mexico City on Thursday, conducted business on Thursday, Friday, Monday, and Tuesday, and returned to New York on the succeeding Friday? So, I'll keep my mouth shut. You guys come up with a number of what you would deduct in this context. Take one minute. Exceptions apply. 
Was that was the question? Do either of the exceptions under 274C apply? No. No, why not? It's over a week. It's over a week. And how much time was spent personally? Uh, more than 25. Oh, less than 25. So less or more? You use it personally. We had three days out of nine days, right? It was personal, right? Right, Larry? 33% was personal, right? Three over nine. Everyone agree? So neither exception applies. Agreed? So, Jackie, so Karen, what's deductible here? Non-deductible. Jackie, you agree? So you're saying if it's over one week, uh, you can't deduct anything? I'm not saying anything. That's what Karen's saying. Is that what 274C says? How much would you deduct here? Larry? portion. It's how you have to pay the trouble expense. Because none of the exception applies here, so we follow 274C1, the general rule. Right. And then we have to allocate. So we follow the general rule under 274C1, which says what? We can deduct six, six. nines which would be $600, right? Karen, right? 274C permits you to deduct not the entirety, but a portion. In the prior problem, one of the exceptions to that rule applied, and we can deduct the entire thing because the trip was less than one week. And then, you got that? The meals. The meals? Or the lodging and the meals would be deductible based on how many days we were, you know, business days. And the meals based on how many business days, subject to the 50% limitation. You can include the lodging and the meals because you can't. If you're in Australia or the China, you okay, can't. Well, okay, so it still is fine then. Okay, right. So it's still six nights for all of them. Six nights. Okay. Question G. What results in E above if the traveler's trip to Mexico City is to attend a business convention? So this time we're going to Mexico City, not um, a business, but so you're going, you are, but to a business convention. And of course, everyone's patenting code section 274H. Yes. By the way, let me give you one more example, Larry. You'll appreciate this. Suppose you had a business trip in China, okay? Suppose you had a business trip in China, okay? And the airfare is $1,500. Just to, and um, you have to go to China, it's an important business trip, and you go to China, you spend three days in these intense meetings, okay? Everybody, intense meetings, and then you spend 12 days traveling the Great Wall of China, okay? Three days, tense meetings, 12 days climbing the walls, right? Um, if you haven't been, by the way, it's kind of neat. I had a good fortune two or three years ago, the first time in China. All right, so in that instance, Jackie, I didn't hear from you last time, so deductible or not, that $1,500 airfare to get to China. By the way, James, you'll appreciate it. I, I, I always go coach. What helps? Ambient. Who cares where you're sitting or sleeping? <laughs> How long was this? Right. It's the same. Jack, it's the same. It's the night. You, go, you go for three days on business, uh -huh. 12 days to climb the walls of China. <laughs> so airfare is 1500 uh, I would say not deductible because the business, uh, the trip is primarily um, for personal. Okay, so GAA, you're great. 
Yes, Jeff? Is that yet? Yeah. Sure, okay. All I want to make sure, because some people hear this and they say, gee, 315 should be deductible, right? No, we never even get to code section 274C because, right, Jackie, you're spot on. It's never deductible because it never meets 162. You never get to 274, right, unless, unless it meets 162. And here, it's, the trip is primarily personal, so you don't get to deduct any of the airfare, right? So, Jackie, thank you. Right. Last question. What results in E above if the trip is to Mexico City, where we're looking at position um, 274H, which says, in the case of any individual who travels to a convention, seminar, or a similar meeting held outside the North American area, no deduction shall be allowed for expenses eligible to such meeting unless the taxpayer establishes the meeting is directly related to the active conduct of his trade or business. And it has to meet this, all these requirements. However, if you look at H3, the term North American area means the U.S. positions and the trust territory of the Pacific Islands and Canada and Mexico. That being the case, have we traveled outside the North American area, guys? No, right? So therefore, we are not subject to the limitations of Code Section 274H. Only if we travel outside the North American area. So this would be deductible to travel expenses. All right, any questions? All right, so why don't we do this, guys? Uh, why don't we do a breakdown?